Grace. Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, uh, I think we'll get going. Uh, my name uh, is Andrew Morrill. I'm a professor here and chair of academic programs. And together with uh, Deborah, Professor Deborah Crone, um, I'd like to welcome you to our first session of the Early Modern Renaissance uh, Visual and Material Culture Seminar. And uh, it is a tremendous pleasure for me uh, this evening to welcome Professor Mark Meadow, who is Professor and Chair of the Department of History of Art at an architecture at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, Professor Meadow needs no introduction uh, to, to you as uh, a scholar of Northern Renaissance art and culture, acknowledged especially um, as a leading expert in the history and theory of early modern collecting. Um, in a series of monographs, of edited volumes and articles, He's written widely on such topics um, involving 16th century Dutch and Flemish art, um, such as the relationship between art and rhetoric, early modern ritual and spectacle, print culture, social networks, and in recent years, the origins of the Kunst und Wunderkammer. And tonight's talk, indeed, is a continuation of themes he developed in his most recent volume, the first treatise on museums, Samuel Kiekeberg's inscriptions, 1565, which was published in 2013 by the Getty Research Institute. And this comprises a translation and critical edition of the first known treatise on collecting, written for the Duke of Bavaria, and provides a rationale and organizational system for an ideal princely Kunst und Wunderkammer. Um, Professor Meadow argues in particular that Kiekeberg conceived the collection primarily as a kind of research laboratory whose primary function was essentially pragmatic, to encourage technological innovations that would serve the ends of state. And so his work thus offers a pointed counterpart, if not corrective, to uh, existing modern scholarship uh, and its preoccupations with notions of wonder, with social explanations of power and status, or mystical notions of universal knowledge as the core concepts at play in these collections. Um, now, Professor Meadows' interest in rhetoric and in the structures of knowledge is already in evidence in his first book, Peter Bruegel the Elder's Netherlandish Proverbs and the Practice of Rhetoric of 2002, where he argued that Bruegel's compositional techniques were derived from mental habits formed by um, rhetor rhetorical procedures um, of amassing quotations and sententia uh, linked to educational methods in the compiling of commonplace books. Um, he's also published a, a critical edition of another important 16th century source, Simon Andriessen's 1550 Deutsche Adagia, um, in 2003. Um, he's the editor of various vo uh, volumes on uh, Bruegel and civic spectacles, print culture, um, and has been the, uh, the he is the co-founder and editorial board member of the book series Proteus, Studies in Identity, Formation in Early Modern Image, Text, Ritual, Habitat, with Brepols, publishers in Belgium. And he's been the recipient of many grants and, uh, and prizes, uh, the Berlin Prize for the American Academy in Berlin. Um, uh, other awards include uh, grants from the Crest Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the Belgium American Education Foundation, the uh, Paul Getty Grant Program, the Delmas Foundation, uh, the list goes on. <laughs> um, he was also, for, for between 2006 and 2011, Professor for History and Theory of Collections at Leiden University, in addition to his position at Santa Barbara. So with all that, uh, without more ado, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Professor Meadow, the title of his uh, Talk is Prudently Abandoning Wonder on Changing the Governing Concept of the Kunstkammer. Welcome. So, uh, many thanks, Andrew, for the very kind introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank Andrew and Deborah Crone uh, for inviting me here this evening, uh, to Laura Minsky for all the help. Uh, she's provided in making the arrangements, uh, and for the Bard Graduate Center's 
a seminar in Renaissance and early modern material culture uh, for having me as uh, a part of their symposium series. So um, what I want to uh, talk with you about this evening um, uh, can be exemplified by this image, uh, Jan Bruegel and Peter Paul Rubens' Allegory of Sight, uh, which is one of the most frequently reproduced images of an early modern uh, collection. And what I will be doing this evening is actually challenging one of the uh, presumptions that has uh, dominated the field of scholarship on such early modern collections in the 16th and 17th century, and that is the assumption that the governing concept of such collections is wonder, uh, or as it's sometimes expressed in English as well, as curiosity. Um, so uh, these collections, which possess myriad objects, both from art and from nature, that included uh, scientific instruments, uh, other technological uh, marvels, I want to suggest served a very different purpose than the evocation of wonder or awe or even of uh, magnificence. Uh, the term that gets applied to these, the, the use of the term wonder, uh, certainly goes back at the very least to Julius von Schlosser's uh, 1908 uh, monograph, uh, the Kunst und Wunderkammern der Spätrenaissance, uh, published in 1908, uh, from which point almost all scholarship on 16th and early 17th century collections has evoked these terms. Uh, and just as one example would be uh, Catherine Parks and uh, Lorraine Destin's Wonder and the Order of Nature in 2001. Um, so um, what I uh, want to suggest proceeds from uh, this treatise, uh, which is our earliest known treatise on museums and collections, the 1565 um, uh, treatise by Samuel uh, uh, Kuykeberg, uh, a Belgian physician, Flemish physician who worked for the Duke of Bavaria. Um, and I do want to begin um, uh, in a way that I would normally not, which is taking direct issue with a uh, recent statement about this treatise, um, which says that Samuel Kuykeberg's inscriptions is technical and concrete rather than theoretical and abstract. Um, now, I generally am opposed um, to straw man arguments as a way of setting up a lecture. I feel justified in this case <laughs> because that statement is from me. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the introduction to the translation of Kuykeberg's treatise uh, that was published by uh, the Getty in 2013. Um, the point I was trying to make is that Kuykeberg's treatise is really a kind of how-to book, um, how to create a princely uh, Kunstkammer. Um, and I certainly do think that that is still a valid point to make. Um, it reads much more like a technical treatise than it does like a theoretical one. Um, however, uh, when I sat down to write the uh, introduction to the volume that will follow this translation, um, I began looking at um, a particular pair of terms. Um, uh, this is a manuscript um, preface to Kuykeberg's transition, uh, uh, Kuykeberg's treatise, written by his brother uh, Leo Kuykeberg, uh, who took a manuscript copy of the treatise with him down to Italy to try to do two things. One was to shop for an Italian publisher uh, in Venice uh, for the treatise, and the other was to try to convince Emperor Maximilian II uh, at the very least to provide financial support for the publication of the treatise, if not to hire uh, Samuel Kuykeberg as the manager of his collection. And there's a statement towards the end of this preface, uh, which says, because I know of no king, no prince or potentate, who cannot find something that will amuse him and show uh, 
what from such a founded theater might be gained for your majesty's prudentia, your majesty's prudence from such a Kunstwunderkammer. In the uh, uh, premise itself, those two terms, prudentia and Kunstwunderkammer, are immediately juxtaposed with each other. Um, this, by the way, is a unique uh, combination term, Kunstwunderkammer, I know of from no other source. Uh, what I had done was uh, to sit down and I wanted to sort of work out what was implied by the term Kunstwunderkammer. Um, and what I thought I needed to do in order to account for what Kwikeberg was up to in his treatise was write an introduction that would redefine how we understand wonder in the early modern period. But as I began looking more closely at the word prudence associated with it, and then began looking through Kwikeberg's treatise at how he used the term prudentia, I realized that in fact um, there was a, not a translation error per se, but um, I could have been more specific in the translation of this particular term. Um, so even on the uh, <laughs> title page, he uses the term prudence. Um, how? By looking at the many things in this collection, one can acquire a knowledge, and the term he uses for knowledge is cognitio, um, and an admirable, and this is how I'd originally translated understanding of things. Um, uh, prudence is certainly a form of understanding, but what I came to realize is that it means something much more specific than that. Um, uh, that when he's using prudentia, he really does mean prudence in the sense of an Aristotelian form of knowledge. And when he uses the term cognitio, he also means something very particular. So cognitio is a form of knowledge that comes from the use of things, um, uh, from uh, a kind of familiarity that is gained by repeated encounter with things. And that retains that sense best for us with the modern English term recognition. Um, that kind of knowledge that is awakened by re-encountering something that we already know. Um, prudence uh, is something that he very specifically seems to mean in terms of a very practical kind of knowledge, a knowledge that can be put to pragmatic use. Um, and as such, this um, uh, differs from the two other forms of knowledge or wisdom that Aristotle speaks of, uh, which would be either episteme, also known as scientia, or philosophical knowledge on the one hand, and techne, or technical knowledge on the other. Uh, now, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle draws a distinction between prudence what he terms phronesis on the one hand, um, prudence in Latin, prudentia in Latin, um, and either uh, philosophical knowledge or technical knowledge on the other hand. And the distinction he draws is that prudential knowledge, which is the kind of knowledge that a ruler, a government, has to have in order to govern well, um, is always contingent. It is always dependent on the immediate circumstances. It is also a kind of knowledge that is never completed. It's never finished. Um, and that in the sense that there are always further decisions a government has to make, that circumstances continually change, that the balance between what is a benefit to one uh, group in society and what is a benefit to another is constantly shifting, so decisions continually have to be revisited. Uh, episteme, philosophical knowledge, has a definite end. It speaks towards known and knowable truths. Once those have been determined, there is no need for further discourse. Technical knowledge also has a definite end. Uh, whether a, it's a shoemaker making a pair of shoes or a composer writing a piece of music, um, uh, any kind of craftsman plying their trade, once that 
uh, craft has reached its end, the shoes are made or the music is composed or the barrel is constructed for a barrel maker, you might say it's a good or bad pair of shoes or a good or bad barrel, but there is no further need for discourse. Whereas for prudential knowledge, there is a constant need to revisit this. So in terms of what Kuykeberg is attempting to do in his treatise, as I began going back and re-examining the term prudence, I realized there are sort of three main things that we have to take into consideration. One is that he is addressing the treatise directly to his employer, who is Duke Albrecht V of Bavaria, uh, the founder of the Bavarian Kunstkammer, um, at exactly the moment when Kuykeberg is producing his treatise. The Bavarian Kunstkammer is given its formal uh, existence in 1565, um, uh, at the same time that people like the Habsburg uh, rulers in various places, including Maximilian II, are also in the process of forming uh, Kunstkammern as official institutions. Um, and so Kuykeberg is speaking to rulers who, uh, for one thing, are in the, uh, the unique position uh, in Germany at this point of forming unified central governments uh, with authority and responsibility for managing the state economy, state religion, uh, um, and a centralized government. Uh, Bavaria prior to this point had never had a truly uh, centralized government uh, or a centralized economy. So that's the first point, is that um, he's addressing the needs of centralized governments and their prudential needs, their needs to be able to govern efficiently and wisely. The second point is, and this is where I disagree with myself in terms of this not being a theoretical treatise, that I think he is actually attempting something on a very high theoretical, theoretical plane, which is to present what we might call a unified field theory of Aristotelian knowledge, in which both philosophical uh, wisdom and for that matter, technological know-how, techne, become subsumed under the needs of a government for being able to uh, govern wisely, to govern prudently. So both theoretical and technical knowledge get subsumed under the needs of the state. And the third point, and this is in some ways the most radical thing that Kuykeberg is arguing, that the needs of the state, the needs of the government um, to uh, be able to administer prudently can best be accomplished through the production, study, collection, and use of myriad material objects. In other words, collections are of direct utility to the governance of the state. Um, virtuous and wise government depends on the collection and study of material culture. And that is truly a radical argument uh, that is being made. Now, um, not everyone agreed with Kuykeberg. Um, uh, so for instance, we have an admonition from the Bavarian Court Council uh, in 1557, so about eight years before Kuykeberg's treatise uh, is published. Um, this comes in the year before uh, Kuykeberg begins his association with uh, Albrecht V in Bavaria, um, where in the midst of a very long letter that is criticizing the Duke of Bavaria for his expenditures on music, on festivities, on uh, um, uh, various feasts and so forth, there is a passage in which it also recommends that he not expend money on what they call the acquisition of strange luxuries. Um, and he compares that very specifically. He's saying you should not do this in imitation of what the merchants are doing. Um, now, this for me is a very interesting passage because one of the things it points to is that in the formation of this new kind of collection, this pragmatically oriented collection and these also extraordinarily large and diverse collections, that merchants actually have the precedent rather than the princes. So merchants begin assembling these collections first, princes begin imitating them. 
Uh, the usual narrative is the reverse, of course, that princes establish these magnificent collections for the purposes of displaying their wealth and power, and that merchants then later begin imitating them as a means of social advancement. If we reverse that narrative, which I think we have to, and we have to uh, assign primacy not just to merchants in general, but I think the merchants of Augsburg in particular, um, for various circumstantial reasons, uh, it forces us also to consider such collections always to have been, in other words, from the point in the 1530s and 40s that this new kind of collection emerges to have been pragmatically oriented, to have been business oriented um, in their formation. Um, and this, by the, this is uh, a, a page out of the same manuscript that has the Kriegerberg portrait that I showed in my opening screen showing an, a performance of Albrecht V's uh, chamber musicians uh, of music presumably written uh, by his court composer Orlando de Lassus. Um, uh, both the production of the manuscript, the existence of this court orchestra and choir, the hiring of Orlando de Lassus, um, all are part of the luxuries that the court council uh, is objecting to. Now, in terms of collections, these are the kind of objects that the court council might have objected to and which we tend to highlight in our study of such collections today. Um, among other things, they're the most visually fascinating objects uh, uh, that show up in the collections. They point in the direction of, of um, uh, exotic materials such as the uh, ivory trumpet uh, or the uh, iridescent feathers that make up the uh, Mexica feather headdress, um, the jade mask set in gold um, uh, that was brought over from Mexico. Um, and for the court counselors, who are primarily themselves of uh, the minor nobility, these seem to be extravagant expenses with no uh, particular use. Um, uh, Kriegerberg, however, I think points a very different, uh, paints a very different picture of this. Now, um, uh, Albrecht V sends a letter in response to the court council roundly rejecting their criticisms in total. Um, now, they chastise him for his expenditures and recommended that if he insists on continuing to spend money on such things, that he at least take it out of his personal budget rather than out of the state budget. In the letter that he sends in response, he flatly rejects this idea. He insists he will continue uh, spending uh, money on uh, festivities, on music, on uh, uh, processions, uh, and so forth. He doesn't specifically address the issue of collections. And I think the definitive response to the court council in terms of collections comes in Kriegerberg's treatise in the passage that you see here, um, where he is explaining why someone should want to collect these things. And he says that it cannot be expressed by any person's eloquence how much prudence, it's the word he uses again, prudentia, and utility, usus, in administering the state uh, administrandi is the term that he uses, um, as much in the civil and military spheres as in the ecclesiastical and scholarly, can be gained from the examination and study of the images and objects that we are prescribing. Now, by civil, what he clearly means is the economic sector. Uh, military spheres, and we could even go back for a second um, and look at the collecting of Japanese armor, Turkish armaments, um, uh, arms and armor from uh, throughout Europe, uh, where this can be examined with the idea of developing new metallurgical technologies, um, new technologies for developing lighter, more flexible arms, uh, armor, uh, and so forth. He's clearly thinking in terms of technical development in military terms as well. Um, uh, when he refers to the ecclesiastical, aspect of administering the state. We should remember that this treatise shortly follows the Peace of Augsburg, which for the first time assigns the administration of religion to the state. 
And so in Bavaria, Catholicism is the state religion, and we can look to the collections uh, for excellent models uh, or examples of how collecting might uh, uh, be used to administer the state ecclesiastically. And scholarly refers to all kinds of research, um, historical, scientific, um, uh, whatever this uh, might be, all of which can benefit from the collections uh, that uh, are being formed or that Kriegerberg advises forming in his treatise. Now, um, I want to concentrate primarily on the first of these, on the civil or the economic side of things. Now, Kriegerberg begins his treatise with a set of five classes of those things that one might collect. Each class is divided into 10 or 11 subclasses, um, and it forms uh, in the whole a list of all possible things that one might uh, care to collect if you had the means to do so. Um, it also forms a kind of ordering system, at least a conceptual ordering system uh, for such collections. Um, now, in the, um, I think it's the 11th subclass of the first class of objects, and this is the first class of objects is dedicated to the ruler and the um, state. Uh, it includes such things as portraits of the ruler, genealogical tables, uh, maps or models of the principal cities of the state, and so forth. But the final inscription seems an odd one for something devoted to the state and the ruler, and that is tiny models of machines, uh, which he recommends collecting so that, should the need arise, larger ones, in other words, full-scale ones, can be built. Um, but what he goes on to say is so that one might compare different models with each other and develop better technologies. Now, the kind of machines he's talking about is mining machinery, machinery for draining swamps, machinery for driving piles, machinery for um, building roads or constructing walls, large-scale engineering machinery. Now, what I'm showing you here, um, there's a reason I'm showing you a miniature model. Uh, um, I would say sometimes this is referred to as a wood pulping mill, sometimes as a butter churner. Um, uh, but the reason I'm showing you an 18th century <coughs> model um, is when uh, we were publishing the Quiqueberg Treatise, um, one of the things I wanted to illustrate were the miniature models of machines. So I began hunting around for a good photo of a late 16th century miniature model of a machine and discovered that no such thing exists. Um, in fact, no such thing really exists until the 18th century. There are a few here and there in the 17th century. They really only began to be produced in the 18th century, by which time engineers had worked out that there's really no point in building them in the first place because large-scale engineering machinery is not scalable in things in terms like torsion and strength of materials and so forth. Um, so what is Kriegerberg doing in proposing this as a class of collectible object? It's a class of things that did not exist. He's projecting, based on what he knows that goldsmiths and clockmakers and so forth can do, that they could produce such things that one could assemble, for instance, many, many examples of mining machinery, and then when a new mine is open, you can look to see which might be the best model or combine existing technologies to develop something better. This seems to be what he has in mind in terms of using the collection to administer the state in civil or economic terms. Um, to give another example, and this will tie it back to Augsburg and Augsburg merchants, um, uh, and here I'll give a nod to uh, Andrew and his research on Augsburg practitioners and Christoph Schissler in particular. Um, Schissler was a goldsmith in Augsburg in the 16th century who began producing scientific instruments, as many Augsburg goldsmiths did. Uh, and I'm just showing you a couple examples of the objects that they produced. Now, the Fugger family, which is the group of Augsburg uh, merchant bankers, 
in whom I'm most interested in, became collectors on a major scale, um, already beginning in the 1530s. Um, in other words, 30 years or more before the great princes begin assembling such collections. Um, the earliest known use of the term Kunstkammer, by the way, is in the description of Raimund Fugger's collection. Uh, and that term comes, it's from 1546. Um, so before it gets applied to any collection from the Habsburgs or the Wittelsbachs, that term is applied to a Fugger collection. Now, each member of the Fugger family from the 1530s on seemed to have specialized in particular kinds of collecting. Uh, one member of the family collects um, uh, ancient manuscripts. Um, one member of the family collects musical instruments. And uh, in his collection, there are, for instance, over 300 lutes in the collection. Now, who on earth needs 300 lutes? Um, how would you even store 300 lutes? Um, but nonetheless, that's what this person collected. And one member of the family collects what are called mathematical instruments. Um, in other words, things such as these that are produced by uh, Schussler. Now, the production of such objects in relation to the Fugger family is a really interesting situation because the way the Fugger family made their wealth, um, they started out as, as laborers. Um, they were cloth finishers. Um, they migrated from Bohemia to Augsburg at the end of the 15th century, uh, where the family is working as cloth finishers. One member of the family decides that he will start importing cloth to be finished directly rather than paying a middleman to do so. Within three generations, the family is arguably one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, in all of Europe. The way they did this is once they had a certain amount of money, a certain amount of capital, um, they loaned it out to um, princes, uh, to the uh, Wittelsbachs and the Habsburgs in particular. And they came up with a very clever idea, which is to secure the loans against real estate, against mines. And these were primarily copper, sometimes silver mines. The terms of the loans were always the same, that as long as the loan was outstanding, the family received, the family business received the proceeds of the mine. If the loan was not paid back on time, and it never was paid back on time, um, the ownership of the mine reverted to the family permanently. So the uh, Fuggers became large scale um, traders in copper and silver as commodities. Um, and it leads to some very fascinating things. Say, for instance, broker a trade deal um, uh, with Africa, where they trade um, uh, several thousand hundred weight of what are called copper rings. These are really, these are quite obviously manila rings. Uh, they look like um, copper bracelets, brass bracelets, um, in exchange for an equivalent amount of ivory to be returned to Europe. Um, and what's really fascinating about that particular exchange is that um, the Fuggers, in sending these copper or copper alloys over as rings, are sending them in a form that will be accessible and usable in Africa. And it's clear from the contract that the ivory being returned is not raw, raw ivory, but partially finished ivory. We don't know exactly what that means, but presumably there's some level of cultural knowledge in Africa in terms of what will be of use once it gets there. So there's really, there's fascinating things that go on with the Fuggers and copper. But one of these is what happens in Augsburg. So where did um, the Fugger family, when they're collecting mathematical instruments, where did they get them? What they began doing was commissioning goldsmiths, in particular, to begin producing such instruments. Um, uh, so people like Schisler and Augsburg begin producing these things. They go into the Fugger collections. The Fuggers then begin brokering the sale of such objects to other collectors. And Augsburg, as a result, becomes a major center for scientific instrument production for well over 200 years. Um, so by collecting objects for their Kunstkammer, the Fuggers have created a new industry in Augsburg, 
from which they profit in at least two ways. Um, where are the goldsmiths getting the copper alloys to produce these instruments? The Fuggers are the ones who are mining uh, the copper. Um, the Fuggers are the ones who are brokering the sales of the objects later and making a profit from that. And arguably, the Fuggers, as patricians of Augsburg, are taxing the sale of, and production of such things, which brings money into Augsburg as well. Um, so it becomes an extraordinarily efficient way of managing the city economy as well as the family business. Now, we can see exactly the same thing uh, happening uh, elsewhere. Um, but first, I want to uh, uh, point out something else about Kriegerberg's treatise. Now, the five classes uh, that I mentioned, and I'm not going to get into the particular ordering of them or, or the details of what's contained within these, but this would be the theater or Kunstwunderkammer or Kunst und Wunderkammer that uh, Kriegerberg proposes with these five classes. The miniature models of machine belongs within this first class. What he also talks about, though, is an entire network of workshops, laboratories, display rooms um, that are related to the theater or the Wunderkammer. Um, they include things like the library, a foundry, which has both an alchemical forge and a metalsmith's forge, even the court chapel, management of state religion, but it's a place where valuable objects, including relics and ecclesiastical um, uh, clothing and so forth are kept. Um, printing workshops, including a, and a music room, an apothecary shop connected to the gardens and kitchen, a print collection, um, wood turning workshop where furniture and other things are produced, armories, stables, and so forth. Um, so what he's really saying is that the Wunderkammer is at the center of an entire series of practical spaces. Now, all of these spaces pre-existed um, in the ducal uh, household. Um, they had to have kitchens, they had to have stables, uh, and so forth. Where do you get the furniture to outfit the palace? The furniture maker has to make them, and so forth. Um, Albrecht V has recently acquired printing presses. Um, uh, Kriegerberg proposes you need special presses for both printing mathematical treatises with their formulae and music books, and he knows Albrecht V is very seriously interested in music. But in any event, this is part of an entire series, an apparatus by which the ducal household operates. But what he seems now to be proposing is that this can become an incipient apparatus for managing an entire nation, an entire state. Um, so in other words, if you're going to centralize a government, you have to have the ability to manage at a technical level the needs of the state. Um, so, and just uh, so it's a little bit more readable, um, these are the kind of spaces uh, that uh, Kriegerberg uh, mentions in the course of the section of his treatise on workshops and laboratories. Now, at exactly the moment when Kriegerberg is finishing his treatise, um, and this, uh, the treatise appears in, I think it's October of 1565, um, uh, just about uh, two months before that, if I'm accurate about this, um, uh, um, Francesco Primo de' Medici travels north from Florence to collect his bride, Joanna of Austria, who happens to be Albrecht V's sister-in-law, the sister of um, Anna of Austria, who is married to the Duke of Bavaria. On this trip, Francesco visits Prague, uh, Vienna, uh, Ambras, or Innsbruck with the um, collections at Ambras, and he visits Munich. Um, all of which have collections of this kind, but he arrives in Munich um, as Kriegerberg is completing his treatise, and then he proceeds down to Italy. Now, when he returns to Italy, he gets married. As it happens, the representatives sent from the Bavarian court to 
uh, represent Albrecht V at the wedding is Hans Jakob Fugger, um, who had run the Fugger business and in a complicated bankruptcy proceeding ended up being the chamberlain of the uh, court in Munich. Um, Hans Jakob Fugger, the original employer of Samuel Kriegeberg, um, moves with Kriegeberg to work for the Bavarian court. He ends up being the representative uh, down at the wedding of Joanna of Austria and Francesco Primo de' Medici. Francesco um, uh, restructures the Medici Studiolo, including the images that you see here, which include pictures of a number of workshops and laboratories. And here we can see, in fact, Fran Francesco de Medici visiting the alchemical workshop um, associated with the Studiolo, visiting the um, glass blowing workshop that he establishes in Florence. Um, so in other words, what Francesco Primo de Medici seems to be doing in Florence is putting into practice this system of workshops and laboratories in relation to the ducal collections. Now, this has, again, practical consequences in Florence. So we might look at these two pieces of glassware produced by the glassblower Bartolo d'Alvese, who Francesco lures away from Venice to come and establish a glassblowing workshop uh, in Florence. Um, and so these are the kind of objects that Bartolo d'Alvese is producing for the ducal collections. Um, there's a reason why both of these are labeled as coming from the Museo Galileo, because Bartolo d'Alvese does not only produce luxury glassware like this, he also produces optical glass and lenses. Um, now, he's established a glass blowing workshop from which luxury objects and for that matter, um, uh, custom ground lenses are sold uh, elsewhere as well. Another example in Florence is the Officio della Pietra Dure, the workshop in hard stone uh, that the Medici Dukes establish in Florence and begin commissioning objects from. Um, so here we see a beautiful cabinet in Pietra Dure that was commissioned for the Medici uh, collections. Um, just as with the Schistler uh, scientific instruments, um, once people begin viewing these Pietra Dure <coughs> objects in the Florentine collections, they become a required object for any respectable collection in Europe. People begin commissioning objects from them, and indeed it is very hard to go to any major national museum uh, in Europe that has decorative arts in it and not find a Florentine uh, Pietra Dure piece in it. <coughs> now, the Pietra Dure workshop continues to produce things for centuries. Um, this is an example of something that's produced in the same workshop established by the Medici Dukes uh, in 19th century uh, Florence. And indeed, today, you can still, as a tourist, go to Florence and uh, if you have uh, enough money to do so, buy a piece of Pietro Dore work, um, a small table, um, a, a tray, a tea tray, something like this to bring home with you. In other words, a luxury industry, a high-end industry is created in Florence that persists for centuries as a direct result of the patronage of collectors. Um, so this becomes both in terms of the, you know, technological production of large-scale engineering machinery, but also in the production of various crafts and industries that can then support the livelihoods of local populations, form a tax basis, and so forth. Um, this would be how such collections can be used in practical terms. Now, um, this got me, in turn, once I began thinking about collections and workshops in this way, it brought me to this particular set of paintings. Um, uh, these are the uh, five allegories of the senses um, by Jan Broil the Elder and Peter Paul Rubens um, uh, that we can reasonably assume were produced for the 
uh, initially regents of the Spanish Netherlands, Albert and Is Isabella, um, but who for a brief period of time become the direct rulers of a new state, the state of the Spanish Netherlands. Um, uh, we're lacking the documentary evidence to firm, we don't have a commission for these, but they're given as a gift by the archdukes um, uh, and um, there are enough objects within them that we know were within the ducal collections. They include portraits of the archdukes um, uh, and other signs that we can be reasonably sure this was in fact produced for Albert and Isabella themselves. Now in each of these images, um, with slight variations, there's a very similar structure. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a pair of allegorical uh, figures, personifications representing each sense. In each case, they're shown experiencing the particular scent. And so here, the exchange between uh, the woman and the Cupid-like figure here, the kiss between them, uh, which I have to say is just about the only positive reference to the sense of taste uh, in the image, is showing them experiencing it. Um, uh, there are images which usually elaborate on the experience of this. There are objects that are shown as if they were in a collection. Um, uh, and each of the objects includes within it a workshop or laboratory space. Finally, um, all but this first that I'm showing you here, in the background you can see one of the archducal residences. Portrayed in the background uh, of this. So, um, in the allegory of touch, we notice, um, and we might as well call them Venus and Cupid, uh, exchanging uh, a kiss here. And as I mentioned, this would seem to be out the only positive reference uh, to the sense of touch. Above them, a scene of Christ being flagellated. Um, this is a scene uh, of the circumcision. Um, uh, being shown a battle scene up here. Um, but we might, for instance, look at the objects that are arrayed on the table. Um, and uh, the uh, particular instruments that are shown there um, are late 16th century dental instruments. Um, these two things down here, those are a couple of pulled teeth. Um, and uh, either the laughter or grimaces that I see at this point um, are exactly what the point here is, that as a viewer you are meant sympathetically um, to experience something of the sense, in this case of pain, sense of touch, elicited by these, which is further elaborated. This is a military amputation saw. Um, these are cauterizing irons down here uh, for cauterizing wounds. Um, that is what this is, is meant to evoke, is that sense of touch. Um, elsewhere in the image, we see, um, well, let me first deal with this, and I'll get back to the collecting part. Um, what we see in the background here is a blacksmith shop, um, a foundry in which arms and armor are being produced. And the clear reference here is, is the idea of war, of battle, and to the kind of battle injuries that need amputation saws and cauterizing irons and so forth. In other words, the infliction of pain through war. Um, uh, this piece of armor down here we know was owned by um, Albert, uh, Archduke <coughs> Albert, um, as part of his ceremonial armor, which is part of what I mean. This is another example of Japanese samurai armor over here, by the way. Um, so we have a place where this armor is being produced. Now the arms and armor that are being produced are of two kinds. One is practical, everyday armor that you would actually wear into battle. And the other kind is ceremonial armor that you wear in processions uh, and so forth. And if we look over here, we see armor um, that is in a display cabinet with the curtains pulled aside to reveal this. And this reminds us that an important adjunct to what we think of as Kunst und Wunderkammer are in fact collections of arms and armor. Um, so this is produced for display in this sense uh, as well. 
If we move along, sense of taste, um, this is the only clothed personification we have. Um, a woman seated at a table with a very lavish uh, feast upon it, um, uh, experiencing the sense of taste again. Um, uh, there are again scenes of biblical scenes of feasting up above. There's a level of self-referentiality in these images, by the way, much of what you see in them. Um, this would be a collaborative painting between Jan Bruegel and Peter Paul Rubens. You see other familiar Rubens paintings, other familiar Bruegel paintings within this. Um, what we see above the door here is a painted version of a print produced by Jan Bruegel the Elder's father, Peter Bruegel the Elder, uh, of the Fat Kitchen. Um, off to the side, we see things one might eat, such as deer or wildfowl or something like that, out in nature. Um, you see them after the hunt, um, uh, sort of in the process of working their way into uh, what we eventually get to, which is the kitchen scene, where they are productively turned into uh, what one consumes at the meal table. There's again a display space, um, this kind of stepped credenza, in which both precious objects, um, you see very elaborate vessels here, you see um, uh, Japanese crockware, uh, Venetian or uh, perhaps more locally produced um, uh, elaborate glass on this, but you also have fruit and confections displayed. In other words, some of the most expensive food that is consumed uh, at the table. This is uh, that painting of the Fat Kitchen uh, by, um, or a, a sort of painted version of the print uh, by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Um, the sense of hearing, um, uh, a woman uh, playing at the lute, listening to a cockatoo in her ear. Uh, there's a collection of chiming clocks uh, and so forth over here. Um, one of these, and it's located just over here, probably produced by the um, uh, engineer and scientist Cornelis Drebbel, uh, the inventor of a perpetual motion machine um, uh, that gets depicted in many uh, collection uh, paintings, also owned by, in this case, Archduchess Isabella. Um, the, uh, so again, the uh, performance thing, I'm not entirely sure why there's a deer here, unless it's because it has a keen sense of hearing. Um, uh, but there are also sometimes, and there's a, <coughs> not quite sure why the cat is <coughs> climbing out there. Um, but if we look over here, um, what he offers us as a kind of workshop space appears to be a rehearsal room um, of musicians uh, uh, performing part music. Um, there's a special kind of music stand for displaying the different parts uh, of a multivocal uh, composition. We can identify the particular music on here, which is produced by Albrecht. Uh, Albert and Isabella's court composer. Um, there's collections of musical instruments uh, and so forth. Um, one of the things I particularly like in this is you can just see a trumpet um, protruding out from the window there, um, uh, perhaps announcing that um, the Archdukes will appear on the balcony uh, for an audience, but um, in any event. And uh, the sense of smell. Um, uh, in which, once again, allegorical figures, um, objects in nature, objects collected in various ways, and a laboratory. So here are um, our allegorical figures sniffing away at flowers. This is a civet uh, from whose musk glands um, a perfume is produced. And I think to this day, in very high-end perfumes, there is still musk civet used. Uh, for the most part, it's now artificially produced. Um, again, I have no idea why there are guinea pigs down here, other than Jan Bruegel really likes guinea pigs. Um, they show up in many, many of his paintings. Um, but the experience of smell, um, uh, um, there's a hound dog, keen sense of smell over here, flowers growing out in nature. 
flowers growing in pots, sort of moving from nature into growing flowers in pots, flowers in vases, and then as we move to the background, uh, what we have are gardeners tending and collecting flowers and then an alchemical distillation laboratory. Um, uh, just before the talk, I was chatting with uh, Christine Griffiths, who's working on uh, perfume distillation laboratories here at the Bard. Um, uh, one of the things to note, I mean, this is exactly the kind of equipment one would find in an alchemical forge, an alchemical laboratory. Um, we tend to think of the production of perfume as something which is producing a luxury, a, an extravagance, something that smells nice, but perfumes were also understood medicinally in this period as well. And what we see within this image also is a connection between court gardens and the production of things like medicines and uh, perfumes as well. Um, and then finally, there is the allegory of sight. Um, and I've arranged them in this order because I like to end with this one. I like to begin with a sense of touch. I'm not really proposing they come in any definite order uh, in this case, but um, what we have here follows the same pattern. Um, there are display spaces, there are the allegorical figures. We have a combination of instruments and images and other kinds of artifacts uh, related to this. We have, in the distance, uh, a portrait of one of the ducal residences. Um, we have a painting by Peter Paul Rubens. We have a joint painting by Rubens and Jan Brodel the Elder here. Um, <coughs> just to look in, in detail. In fact, what the personification of sight is looking at is a Jan Boyle the Elder painting uh, um, that is being displayed to her by this. This um, telescope likely produced by Cornelis Drebbel, uh, again, who worked for, in particular, Archduchess Isabella uh, of Austria. Um, uh, where the lenses come, I'm not sure. Um, but in any event, scientific instruments, and this, you know, one of the earliest depictions we have of a telescope uh, uh, within uh, uh, collections, magnifying glass over here for closely examining things. So the experience of sight tied in uh, with a painting, display spaces, um, antiquities um, over here, uh, large scale sculpture, and uh, a painting gallery uh, in the back. We might think of such galleries as being the kind of laboratory and workshop in this image. Um, I have to say, I'm a little happier thinking of what we see immediately behind the personification of sight, which is in fact a Kunst und Wunderkammer, uh, with all of the myriad kinds of things one might uh, collect within it. Um, as being exactly that kind of laboratory of sight within the image, including a portrait of Albert and Isabella, the likely patrons, um, elaborate vessels made out of figured um, uh, agate, uh, other brightly colored stones, scientific instruments, um, uh, natural objects, mathematical instruments down here, uh, and so forth. In other words, all the kind of objects that Quiqueberg describes in his treatise. Now, as an afterword to this, I want to suggest that this kind of pragmatically oriented collection, knowledge producing collection, um, does not end uh, in the 16th or 17th century. From it um, come two kinds of institutions. One is the, one kind of institution are the public museums with which we are all familiar today, uh, which continue, at least to some degree, to be supported uh, by the state. Um, and we can think of something like the Victorian Albert Museum and its original mission, which was su to support technology and craft in Britain. Um, as an example of exactly the kind of thing uh, that Quiqueberg might uh, talk about. But the other, um, oh, sorry, uh, actually one last point before I finish my final point. What I just wanted to point out, returning to Quiqueberg's list of workshops, what I've done is underline minimally the set 
of workshops and laboratories that we've just seen in these Bruegel, Rubens, allegories of the senses. Um, in other words, what I'm suggesting for this set as a whole is that we not think about these simply as allegories of the senses or as lavish displays of the wealth that someone like Albert and Isabella might command. In fact, it's a problematic notion to think of them uh, as especially wealthy in these terms, um, but rather to think about this set as an allegory of good government. Um, these are produced in exactly the period when um, Philip uh, II of Spain has um, uh, given sovereignty to the Spanish Netherlands to Albert and Isabella under a certain set of conditions. The two most obvious or most um, uh, stringent of those conditions are that the Southern Netherlands remains Catholic. Um, in other words, they have to maintain state government um, and put down uh, Protestant heresy. Um, they also have to produce an heir, and that's ultimately where this fails. They do not produce an heir, and sovereignty returns to the Spanish crown. However, the, uh, you know, another condition is they have to produce a viable state. They are taking over the Spanish Netherlands at a point in time after there has been significant damage to the economy from war, from embargoes, uh, so where they have to rebuild the infrastructure of the state. And what I would suggest is they are here proposing that they have the knowledge, the access to the technological know-how to produce a viable state economy in part through their collecting activities that this has now become, the display of such collections has become an attribute of wise and prudent governance. Now, the final point I wanted to make about this is that we don't just inherit from these early collections our system of public museums of history, technology, science, art, and so forth, um, but also universities and university collections. Indeed, many um, European universities receive their core collections from what were originally what we would think of as Kunst und Wunderkammern. Um, what begins to develop in the 19th century is a system in which the collection and display of artifacts, um, specimens, and materials becomes an integral part of the research university. So what I'm showing you here is a plan of a new building for Marshall College at the University of Aberdeen. It just happens to be a very convenient way of, dis of showing this, in which you look floor by floor and you see the dis disciplines of the university divided up into the practical spaces that they occupy. And just to take a detail out of these plans, you can see archaeology is over here which has an archaeological museum um, uh, and uh, collection. There is surgery with the practical room, um, in other words, where surgery is actually uh, conducted, a lecture theater, um, but there's also a museum uh, connected to it, including a pathological museum, medical jurisprudence, the uh, uh, medical law taught over here, which has its museum, natural history with its museum, and so forth. So in other words, each and every discipline of the university uh, is provided with its lecture space, a retiring room for the professor, but in almost all cases with a museum. Now one of the other strands of research that I have done in my career is I spent 10 years researching the material collections of the University of California. Um, a, looking at what are now 10 campuses, it was nine when uh, we began the project. Um, uh, the project was never completed, uh, in part because we ran into the Great Recession and the uh, retraction of funding for such things, um, but partly because of the scale of it. By the end of the project, um, our um, uh, estimate of the size of the universities collections were over 150 million mm -hmm. objects and specimens. 
Um, and, uh, and this is mostly a term that has meaning for administrators, um, but in replacement costs. If one were to try to reconstruct equivalent collections today, um, uh, the cost would be over $50 billion to do so, which dwarfs the university's library system, both in quantity and in cost. Now, if you ask people where does the collective knowledge of the university reside, almost everybody will say it resides within the, u the university library. Um, what we discovered is, in fact, there's a vast economy of knowledge, um, which is almost completely invisible because it's hidden behind departmental walls and in departmental reporting structures. Um, so despite 10 years of work, we figure we identified about two-thirds of the existing collections in the university. Um, it's a vast resource. And what I suspect is that every university possesses something equivalent uh, to this. Now, these are used in teaching. These are used in research. These are used in um, outreach to the public, the way we might normally think of a museum. They are part of the institutional memory of the institution. They are multifunctional, pragmatic kinds of collections, which is ultimately what these collections in the 16th century were as well. And uh, we can, in a sense, by looking back historically, learn something today about the proper care and management of collections, both in the public sector and within uh, the world of academia. And with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for an immensely rich, um, interesting, and uh, provocative um, thesis. Um, we have time for questions. Um, perhaps we'll take them from here. Or would you Are we happy? Um, well, either way. Um, so yes. the floor is now open. Yeah. In the painting on allegory, yes. the two artists are named there. Are these the two artists who did all these five or four or five of them, or they give you the broad idea and this assistant do it and they do the final touches? It's a really good question, uh, and what I should have pointed out, in each case, we are um, attributing the allegorical figures, the large-scale figures within the image, to Rubens and the rest of the painting to Jan Bruegel the Elder. Um, uh, so all of the paintings of Rubens' paintings was done by, we believe, Jan Bruegel the Elder uh, in this case. Um, undoubtedly, there would have been some level of workshop participation. Um, but these were also, if we're correct, that they're produced for Albert and Isabella. These are very, very high-end clients. Um, we know from Ruben's workshop that he actually had a sliding scale, depending on how much of his hand was involved in the production of the object. So if I had to venture a guess, it would be that there's a very high level of involvement of both artists in these works. They're um, superbly crafted. But so how long it take to paint that one of them? <laughs> it would take at a minimum months to produce each. I would say um, years. <laughs> uh, they're produced with an oil glazing technique. Each layer has to, which of uh, translucent glazes. Um, and any given painting, and I, I don't know the details for this one, can have 10, 20, 30 different layers to it, and each layer has to dry completely before the next one is applied. Um, and so simply the physical process of producing it requires months of work to do so, but there are five of them being produced, so you can move from one to the next, <laughs> and so forth. But the if date, anybody knows better. The uh, date is the final date that's finished? Those, that's the date when they're completed, yes. Okay. Thanks. It's um, thank you very much. Uh, can you go back to one of those paintings? Yeah, like the side. So, I mean, I take everything you said. It's absolutely beautiful. But the thing is that the allegory of sight is looking at a painting of Christ healing the blind, right? Right. And the allegory of hearing in the back, you have a very subtle painting of the Annunciation, right? So there's not just a lot of religious late motive here, but there's some kind of subtle criticism as to looking at the religious image, right? The blind is being healed because they believe, right? 
um, all the other tools and amusements that are triggering the sites are secular, are not devout, are by definition lead to failure. Um, that's not my interpretation. A lot of other scholars interpret these allegories as such. Um, the enunciation, again, the enunciation is in the background, but behind it there's the exercise music, right? The virgin hears the enunciation, she's devout, that's why she's hearing the word of God. But the other secular music is something that is below that, that is not necessarily something that should be admired. And then you come and you read this thing as kind of an elaborate celebration of um, the possessions of the court. And, and I find, I mean, I, I find this very interesting, um, let's say almost a struggle between the more classical art historical interpretation of how the, how the site is you know, kind of expressing criticism and how you take all of these objects as kind of celebratory, but at the same time you're negating the typical history of science interpretation of these objects as kind of objects of wonder. While at the end of the day, I think you reach the same idea of religious well, criticism. Because there's, there's a lot of criticism in these paintings, right? I'm not sure that I see it as criticism. You don't? So, um, there are religious images, I believe, in each of these. And they are chosen on the basis of their relation to the particular sense at hand. Now, if I had to push that point, and it's not something I have done so far, mm -hmm. what I would be inclined to say is I would look at the requirement that was placed on Albert and Isabella that they maintain state religion, in other words, maintain Catholicism. If they did not manage to do so, they would lose um, sovereignty, even if they had produced the mayor. And so if we think back to Kriegeberg and his idea of the collection as administering the state in ecclesiastical terms, then what you have is the reiteration through miracles, Christ healing the blind, um, the miracle of the Annunciation, mm -hmm. the truth of, of Catholicism, as it pertains, in this case, to each of the senses. Um, there are Old Testament scenes as well. The battle scene is an Old Testament uh, scene. But I, I would have a very hard time seeing this as a, a, either criticism of the collection or criticism of religion. No, it's uh, criticism of, of, of secular enthusiasm by uh, you know, that secular potential oh. of artifacts and wonder, which is in a way how you started your lecture tonight. Um, uh, yes, and I, in, in fact, um, uh, the um, criticism of wonder in these terms, um, uh, in fact, goes back to, this is a um, medieval criticism of wonder as a kind of distraction from God. Um, if you remember, I said that originally I sat down to write an introduction for the volume that's supposed to uh, come with the translation, or, or follow uh, my translation of Kriegeberg, and I was going to redefine wonder in this. And part of what I was planning to do with that was to redefine wonder as a necessary precondition for the production of knowledge in specifically early modern terms. And that would have done away with this notion, the, the criticism of curiosity mm -hmm. and wonder. Mm -hmm. And I would stick by that. I don't think by the time you get to the end of the 16th century that wonder and curiosity are being criticized as antithetical um, to religious knowledge. However, uh, what it would have taken me to go through that argument is a sort of complicated jumping through hoops that I can get to much more efficiently by emphasizing prudence. Um, but, yeah. Yes? Oh, hi. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that talk. I, I'm, I'm thinking about your analogy with the university collections, and I'm, I'm just, I'm struck by the, the, the evidence that you presented in we compare, in a sense, those models, for instance, are interesting because he's, he's, it's a theoretical. He's, he's showing how, how a collection like this might be used. And the paintings, 
included with certainly our kind of demonstration piece again of how a collection might be used. What evidence, if any, do we have of how such collections were actually used? And I, I count myself being outside this period know what form that might take, but do we have evidence of you know, if indeed these were part of a state bureaucracy of knowledge, you know, do we have evidence of people consulting the collections for specific purposes or to answer specific research questions or governmental problems or sending scientists to examine, um, as you say, specimens, you know, in the middle of a search for new alloys or something like that? You know, do, do they, in other words, one could presumably do that for a university collection that would be documented. Do we have anything like that for these or does it remain at the level of the, dis the display of the potential for doing so? It's a great question. Uh, and the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, so, and, and you'll notice I was actually, I was really careful not to go down that particular road in this talk. So what I suggested is that Kuykeberg is proposing that such collections serve these functions. And that by the time we get to Bruegel and Rubens, that such collections can become an attribute of princely That's groups. what I took from your presentation right. of this, which I find so, convincing. No, and, but the, the question of whether they were actually used is a, is a really interesting point. Now, on the one hand, I think, for instance, the scientific instruments being produced in Augsburg or the Pietro Dure thing are examples of how they were actually used. And that includes technological developments in the production of what we think of today as scientific instruments and so forth. Um, we do, we have, and the problem is we have very, very little evidence of what people actually did in collections. Now, we do have some concrete evidence. So, or, uh, sorry, not we have some documentary evidence. So, for example, in the um, uh, Archducal collections in Ambras, outside of Innsbruck that um, were the property of the Archdukes of Tyrol. Um, Philip Heinhofer, who visited the collections in the early 17th century, notes that um, mining engineers came into the collection to examine ore samples. Now, what he goes on to say is that um, uh, they were disabused of some of the myths that um, miners had um, about mines. And what on earth that means, I have no idea. But mining engineers went into, uh, into a collection that we assume, or we assumed until very recently, was the exclusive preserve of the highest nobility. Um, mining engineers are certainly not part of that class. And what Kuykeberg's system of workshops and laboratories suggest as well, where do the objects come from? They're produced in these workshops. How are they maintained? They're sent into those workshops um, uh, for maintenance, for repair, uh, and so forth. And so what we might think is not so much concentrating on the collection itself as the site of that productive knowledge, but rather <coughs> this system of workshops and laboratories that surrounds it as the interface between such collections and the sort of practical world of apothecaries and miners and woodworkers and metalsmiths and, and so on and so forth. That certainly works for part of the collection that is about tools and produced things. It's, it's one might need a different explanation for um, the Mexica, you know, headdress or the which, which I could see you providing along those lines. Right. Do we, were these things ever lent? I mean, again, your analogy with library, libraries are lent, and that's how we know they're being used. Were these things ever? Objects are lent, objects are traded. Um, uh, depending on the social class of who is visiting them, um, uh, if somebody especially singles out a particular object for uh, compliments, and they're of a high enough social class, you might be under an obligation to give it to them. Uh, this actually leads to, in some cases, the production of copies of things. So if a particularly acquisitive visitor is on its way, you might substitute some copies um, to keep the originals for yourself. Um, but one of the things, 
Kriegerberg mentions in the sort of more practical parts of his treatise is in fact that you want to do exactly that. Who would not want to give, for instance, um, animal specimens to Conrad Gessner for his collection? Um, so if you encounter particularly interesting objects that don't fit your collection, you can give them to somebody else. One way of growing your collection is you send things you have to somebody else and they'll be obligated to send things of interest to you uh, as well. Um, there's a, a, a research project that I would have loved to have uh, conducted that um, came up when I was at Leiden University, uh, which is the album Amicorum of uh, Bernardus Palladonis in Enkhausen, um, which uh, the two enormous folio volumes of inscriptions from all the people who visited his collections, written in any number of different languages, from uh, uh, as far away as Turkey, perhaps Syria, um, people uh, of the highest noble class, ambassadors, merchants, collectors, and so forth. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of names. And the idea was to create an, uh, a database of everyone in that collection, and then work out five to ten connections that each of those people had in the world of collections, um, run that through an n-dimensional network mapping system, and come up with a way of figuring out how objects, ideas, concepts moved from one place to another in the world of collecting. Um, another really large-scale project that would have required millions of euros of funding um, and before we got that project put together, my time at Leiden ended. Um, but there is, there's something really fascinating to be done in terms of the exchange, and specifically the exchange, in terms of exchanging practical information, which is exactly, for instance, the same thing that happens in entomological collections today, um, where you know an entire collection of, I don't know, some uh, genus of katydids will be sent from one collection to another so that the local specialist who works on that genus of katydids can pursue their research. Um, and he seems to be envisioning something along uh, those lines as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was very fascinating and really, I think, hit a lot of buttons for our students here because there are lots of, um, lots of these objects and concepts that come up in, in various classes that both Andrew and I and, and Etan, many of us teach, so that, that, that's great. Um, among the many things that I, I wanted to um, sort of ask about and, and comment on, I'll save some of that for later, but in terms of um, the sort of the background to collecting and the dealers and all of that, and sort of how these objects got into these collections and where they came from, um, I mean, is that is that anything it was fascinating to hear about the connections between the Medici and, and Albrecht V, and that's something that um, Andrew and I are teaching a class right now on transalpine renaissances, and that's, it's, that's exactly the kind of thing that um, really needs to be brought out more in the scholarship because it's, it, these two worlds are still kept remarkably separate, I, I, I feel. So, but in terms of how um, these people are also probably selling buying and selling and acquiring things when they're traveling and there's, do you come across this in your research at all? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, for me, this brings us back to people like the Fuggers. So, you know, if you're assembling a collection on this scale, you can't go down to the local curiosity shop, um, antique dealer, um, that apparatus doesn't exist in the 16th century. So where did people get these things? Um, uh, there is a, a superb reference uh, book, which is a digest of all of the correspondence of Hans Fugger, who was sort of the secretary of state for the Fugger firm in the second half of the 16th century. This is a German scholar named Crystal Carname who produced this thing. Um, three enormously fat volumes. 
um, each of which, uh, and it, which contains simply digests of each and every letter um, going to or from Hans Fugger for the firm. Not the entire letter, just a, a brief abstract of it. And going through that, and you, you know, other of the correspondence confirms this, you'll see somebody like Albrecht V or one of the Habsburgs who wants to get a New Year's gift uh, for someone or who is looking for something for their collections will send a letter to the Fuggers. The Fuggers will send a letter to their agents in um, one or another entrepot um, uh, who will send a letter back saying, well, here's what I'm able to get. Here are the prices for these things that are available. But what you might also be interested to learn about is that this or that thing is also available. And the sales get brokered this way. So the Fuggers, and I imagine it's true for other uh, such firms as well, have these incredible networks that are set up that are informational networks. They have systems of letters of credit so they don't have to transport money. Um, I mentioned that they're dealing in bulk commodities. Um, they're shipping shipments of all kinds of things all over uh, the place. They become the great specialists in the 16th century in live animal logistics, um, uh, shipping rhinos and giraffes and whoever, you know, whatever else, and getting live animals that are still alive to their destinations. That's remarkable. Um, uh, they have a requirement in place that each of their offices have either a live uh, uh, parrot or monkey in the office. Um, and if you think about why would they do that, it's, I, I would assume it's because it shows that they have a logistical know-how to get whatever they need. So as these commodities are being shipped back and forth, really globally at this point in time, the kind of objects that we see end up in these collections are coming along with them. Um, and then you can look, ship captains acquire such things because they know they can make a profit on them when they get them to port and so forth. So there's, there's a vast amount uh, that's moving through. Um, we know very little, and it's clear that it's happening, for instance, what's passing through Marseille. Um, it must be a major port for this. We know more about Seville and Lisbon. Um, but, yeah. That sounds like a whole other project. It's a big project. <laughs> well, we're, we're coming up to time. Um, I had one question, if I, if I may. Um, and it was really on the concept of prudence itself. Um, well, two things, really. Um, as a contingent form of knowledge, um, does that impact the um, permanence of the collection? In other words, if you're collecting towards a notion of contingency, um, does that mean that the, the, the collection itself is ever-changing? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it's a, if it's a, and, and is there any evidence for that? I mean, I know by the 18th century, the Dresden collections are so vast that they have to be chopped into curatorial departments and so on. You know, there's a lot of reorganization to do. But I just wonder if, and secondly, just um, what other evidences, textual evidences, or uh, is there at the time for this notion of contingent knowledge? Where, where uh, else do we find this in the, in the literature or okay. in the culture? Um, uh, there's a uh, book that Kriegerberg mentions in passing. Um, by Christoph Mileus, or uh, Christoph Milieu, who is a French humanist, um, who in 1551 publishes a treatise on how to write the history of everything, um, uh, how to write a universal history. And just like Kriegerberg's treatise, it's divided up into five books, um, uh, the first three of which is it's the history of nature, is the first book. The History of Government um, is the third book, and the middle book between those, the second book, is The History of Prudence. And the History of Prudence that uh, Mileus produces is, it's, it's actually, it's, it's really fascinating, because it is a comparative development, developmental history of human technology. Um, uh, humans developing speech, leading to signs, leading to writing, leading to printing, 
leading to modern printing in the 16th century. Uh, people living in holes in the ground to you know, rough made shelters, onto housings, onto contemporary architecture, and so on and so forth. So he's doing this kind of technological history uh, through that, and that's what he calls prudence. Um, and what he's doing is he's saying that um, technology takes the raw materials provided by nature, prudently adapts them to the needs of governance. Um, seems to be the structure that he has set up. Um, uh, and there is the revival in this period of the interest in Aristotle's ethics as well as, a, as another uh, backbone to this. So I think there's a basis there. So it there. could be a sort of you know, part of a, a larger revival, re-looking re at Aristotle at this period, where this notion comes into comes to problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the particular thing is this linkage between prudence and technology and techne, yeah. which is distinct from, for instance, the strand of interest in Aristotle and prudence that you get with Machiavelli. Right. Exactly. Um, so it's specifically a northern uh, phenomenon, at least at the outset. I just have yeah. to yeah. say this that there's one, I, I mean, I had to work on this cookbook for a long time, and the preface to this cookbook, there's a reference to, to prudence that is, is really, I mean, it's talking about this, this this cook skills and he's called, you know, it's it's prudence is one of the skills that is most important for him. And I was fascinated by this and kind of tried to tie it to what was really why I use this word in reference to, to, to a chef. And um, it's it, I think you're right, it's this, it's practical reason from Isis, but I don't I don't think it's particularly northern. This is published in 1570 and probably written in the late 1560s, Where? published in Venice. So that's something we could talk about later, but I think that it's happening in other places. Well, okay, in Spain, I, I'm, I'm happy to withdraw the specifically northern. Uh, in Spain, you have Las Casas, he uses the term prudence in 1550 to uh, demonstrate the humanity of Indians based on prudence and technology because it's artifacts. So, and it's exactly the same day. So, yeah, I would, okay. I would also say that it's. I, I'm delighted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, um, <laughs> I will finish. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Um,